series we're running from now until COP27 called Climate Crash Courses. This series was created from the realization that many of us in the climate space have come here actually not from a scientific background. Maybe we come from business or finance or policy or communications. And so there might be some fundamental climate knowledge that we're missing. So this series of climate crash courses are going to be short, just 15 minutes, and they're meant to serve the purpose of filling in some of those gaps in our crucial climate knowledge. So thank you so much for joining us today for the first climate, uh, climate crash course, where we're going to be digging into one of the terms we probably hear about and use most, which is greenhouse gases. So we're gonna look into what they are, how they work, and why they're so bad for our atmosphere. So I'm really pleased that we have with us joining, um, joining from Paris, actually, although she's normally in Medellin, Colombia, we have Paula Andrea Arias, who is a professor at the Environmental School, part of the engineering faculty in the Universidad de Antioquia, where she specializes in climate change in the northern part of South America. And she focuses particularly on atmospheric moisture transport and interhemispheric teleconnections in the region, although we're not going to have time to dive into those terms today. Uh, but she has also served as an author and an editor for IPCC reports. And as an author, she was the first Colombian woman to do so. So we're so excited to have you joining us today, Paula. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, so we're going to just dive right in here and start learning about greenhouse gases with you. And the first question I'd like to ask you is if you could just explain at a molecular level, what makes a greenhouse gas a greenhouse gas? Okay, thanks a lot, Gabriel, for the invitation. So happy to be here. So what we call a greenhouse gas uh, is a type of gas that is in the atmosphere in a natural way. And those type of gases are able to absorb energy in the in the form of a long wave radiation so these gases are able to absorb much part of the energy that uh, in form of the long wave radiation the air is emitting back to the atmosphere so that's why they are absorbing they are kind of trapping energy into the atmosphere and it is because they have a molecular uh, composition that allows them to absorb this type of energy Thank you. So they're trapping infrareds, they're storing that energy in the form of heat in our atmosphere. And you mentioned briefly that they have the molecular structure that causes them to do so. What is that molecular structure exactly? Okay, so when a gas absorbs energy, absorbs uh, radiation, uh, then you can have different type of processes. As you might know, most of the atmosphere is not uh, CO2, is not water vapor, it's actually oxygen, oxygen and nitrogen, which is almost uh, 98, 99% of the atmosphere. Uh, those gases do not have a particular structural, molecular structures that allows them to absorb uh, energy in general, but greenhouse gases, which are less, uh, the concentrations are much less in the atmosphere, are able to do it because they have a composition that allows them to absorb in what is called spec spectral lines. So they are able to absorb radiation, not very energetic, which is the long wave radiation, for instance, infrared radiation. So they are able to absorb this energy without creating any breaking in the molecular bonds. There are other gases, for instance, uh, oxygen or ozone that are able to absorb shortwave radiation. And this radiation is able to break the molecular bonds. That is called a continuous absorption. So it, it, de it depends on the, on the molecular structure of the gases that are in the atmosphere, which allows them to absorb that certain type of energy, uh, probably shortwave radiation or longwave radiations, or not to able to, be, uh, to absorb radiation as uh, many other gases, for instance, nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much for explaining how there are different um, gases in our atmosphere, but only some of them are able to uh, create this warming effect. Uh, so now moving on to the measurements and um, how these gases can be ranked and measured against one another. 
some molecules do have stronger heating effects than others. And the ranking system that we currently use for that is called the GWP, the global warming potential of a gas. So the higher a gas is GWP, the more it's going to contribute to the warming of the earth. Could you briefly tell us how a GWP of a gas is calculated? Okay, so this GWP, which is global warming potential of a gas, is the measure of how much uh, heat this gas is able to absorb in comparison to a reference gas. And the reference gas that is uh, usually used is uh, the more, uh, dioxide, carbon dioxide, which is the, let's say, me, the the uh, greenhouse gas that is uh, increasing the most because of human activity. So this is the reference gas. And how it is estimated, this global uh, warming potential is, is the relationship between the heat that is absorbed by that particular greenhouse gas uh, uh, with respect to the CO2, if the CO2 would have the same mass of the greenhouse gas that you are interested. So for instance, for methane, what you are measuring is the amount of heat that methane is absorbing in comparison to uh, how much CO2 would be able to absorb if it has the same mass of uh, methane. So for CO2, the, uh, the global warming potential is one because you are measuring against the same gas. But for instance, for methane, this it could be depending on the lifetime in the atmosphere, but it could be about 20, 25, uh, which means that this uh, mass of uh, methane is able to absorb much more than uh, the same mass of CO2. Thank you. So carbon dioxide is the baseline for the standard. And then these other gases are measured against that. And surprisingly, as you mentioned, methane, nitrous oxide, some of these other greenhouse gases actually have much higher GWPs. So something else that you mentioned in your answer just now is the lifetime. So adding to uh, how much heat these gases can hold, it's also how long they're going to last in our atmosphere. So why do some greenhouse gases last longer than others? So that is the result of a pretty, pretty uh, beautiful, but also very complex process because the uh, air system has very, very complex uh, processes. So for instance, uh, the, the, the main example that we can give and that we are able to understand is, for instance, water. We know that water is present in the air in, this, in the form of uh, solid water, for instance, ice. We can also have liquid water in the rivers, in the oceans, but we can also have water vapor. So for instance, this water vapor is in the atmosphere because you can have, for instance, processes like transpiration from vegetation, or you can also have evaporation from water sources, for instance, oceans. And then that molecule of water vapor can condensate and fall to the surface in the way in the form of liquid precipitation or also solid precipitation. It can infiltrate in the soil and then you can have like this whole water cycle in the planet. The same happens to other molecules that are uh, other uh, gases, for instance, the case of uh, carbon dioxide. So, for instance, a molecule of carbon di dioxide can, can stay in the atmosphere for very long periods. We are talking about decades, we are talking even about centuries. Why? Because the processes um, in this carbon cycle are very slow. Uh, it is estimated that about 65-80% of the carbon dioxide that is in the atmosphere it is absorbed by oceans. So that is pretty important. Oceans actually are getting a, 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 with a, a small a, or a less a pH. It means oceans have been acidifying. We know that that is a signature of climate change. And the reason is because oceans have been absorbing a lot of the carbon dioxide that has been emitted by human activities. And there are other processes, not only ocean. For instance, soils are pretty important Re uh, soil respiration is pretty important in the uh, absorption of uh, carbon dioxide, uh, but also, for instance, very slow processes like fo rock formation, uh, rock weathering, are also involved in the in the capture of CO2 from the atmosphere. So that's why these processes are too slow, and that's why a molecule of CO2 can stay, uh, like I said, decades or even centuries in the atmosphere. 
But for instance, if you compare to methane, which is another important greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, uh, processes are much, uh, much more faster because uh, you have oxidation of this uh, methane in the atmosphere because of chemical reactions in the atmosphere. So that's why a molecule of uh, uh, methane in the atmosphere can stay for, let's say, 10, 12 years. So th this is a, what is called a short-lived a climate forcer in the in the atmosphere. So that's why it's pretty important to keep in mind that the emissions of a carbon dioxide that we have now in the atmosphere are not the result of the activities we made one year ago or two years ago or the day before. It is the result of activities that we had centuries ago or decades ago. So that's why it's so important to keep in mind that these gases can have different lifetimes in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's a really important point. And thanks for making the comparison to the water cycle. I think that was very helpful for understanding how these work. So moving on, now that we know how greenhouse gases are constructed and why they're dangerous in terms of what they can absorb and what they can trap and how long they can live, uh, let's turn to how they're most commonly emitted. So why does the burning of fossil fuels release greenhouse gases? Okay. So the atmosphere uh, by nature has uh, greenhouse gases. That is something is pretty important to mention because sometimes I get the idea that people have in mind that greenhouse gases are made only by human activity. There are natural ways to have uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And it's important to mention that the concentration of these gases is pretty, pretty small in comparison, for instance, with oxygen and nitrogen, as I mentioned in the, in the previous answer. So natural sources for different uh, greenhouse gases Water, for instance, water vapor is the is the most abundant uh, greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. As an, I mentioned, evapotranspiration and evaporation, even sublimation in uh, ice areas are a source, natural source for uh, water vapor. But we can also have, for instance, a human-made uh, sources, for instance, irrigation. We are now using a lot of irrigation, which is giving uh, water vapor to the atmosphere. In general, uh, let's say that the uh, scientific evidence shows that the an uh, anthropogenic effect uh, of uh, water vapor concentrations in the atmosphere is pretty small. But there are some uh, studies actually debating that, uh, mentioning that, for instance, irrigation could be pretty important in regional or local water cycles. So it's important to keep in mind that. Another important uh, uh, greenhouse gas is, of course, uh, CO2. CO2 is, is not as uh, common in the atmosphere as uh, water vapor, but it's the greenhouse gas that is uh, uh, increasing the most the con concentration due to human activities. Uh, CO2 is in, in a natural form in the atmosphere because we have a lot of processes. For instance, we have uh, volcanic eruptions. We can give you uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. We can also have the decomposition of vegetation, the decomposition of biomass. We can also have wildfires that are caused by natural aspects. So you also have outgassing in, in the ocean that gives a CO2 to the atmosphere. So you can have these natural sources. But of course, the anthropogenic sources are mostly related to uh, fossil uh, fuel burning uh, because the, let's say the uh, carbon, one of the largest reservoirs of carbon in the air system is not actually in the atmosphere. Is neither in the soil or is neither in the in the ocean. It's actually in the huge depths of the Earth's core and Earth's mantle. It's a huge uh, depth uh, with respect to the to the surface, and that's why we found when we had access to the first uh, fossil fuel operation, right? So we have accelerated the natural cycle of carbon by having access to, to these fossil fuels. In methane, for instance, methane is an important gas. It's also in a natural way in the in the atmosphere. For instance, wetlands are pretty important for providing methane to, to the atmosphere. Uh, it is estimated that about 80% of the natural sources of methane are the wetlands, but we can also have other processes, natural processes that give a, 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 it gives a concentrations of methane in, in the atmosphere. But also, 
uh, fossil fuel burning gives methane to the atmosphere, which if you remember, it has a pretty a large global warming potential uh, with respect to, to, to CO2. And these uh, uh, anthropogenic sources could be not only uh, the fossil fuel itself, fracking, for instance, which is as associated to fossil fuel, uh, no conventional ways to extract fossil fuel, but also gas, gas is pretty important in emissions, in anthropogenic emissions uh, of methane. So then you can have these natural sources, but also the anthropogenic sources, which are mainly related to fossil fuel burning, but also land use. Land use is also, uh, although in a minor uh, proportion with respect to fossil fuels, but in some regions, for instance, like Latin America, uh, the changes in, in land use can also be a source of greenhouse gases. Uh, for instance, when you uh, deforestate a region, then you lose the natural way like vegetation captures uh, carbon. And in that case, you can have increased uh, concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, so there are these different, very complex ways to uh, modificate, to modify the different uh, cycles of these greenhouse gases. And that is why human activity has altered uh, the air system climate. Uh, in ways that have not been observed uh, in even a million of years. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for touching on so many things in that answer and digging in a bit into the, those natural cycles and how, we're, how we are modifying them, how we are affecting them, and therefore changing the natural ways that have protected our atmosphere for so long. So we're just about up on time here. So I'll pose one more question to you before we wrap up which um, maybe we'll end on a positive note here, let's see, but what are the best ways we have at the moment to recapture the dangerous greenhouse gases that we've emitted? Okay, so regarding that question, I want to be careful because I want to start uh, saying that uh, any type of uh, carbon capture could be able to offset the emissions that we are currently having. So it means we really need urgent reductions of greenhouse gases emissions, not only CO2, but also, for instance, methane, which we explained that has a pretty short life cycle in the atmosphere, and that's why it can compensate uh, some of the increases of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. So the, the, quest, the answer that I'm going to give to this question is under that framework. We need to reduce greenhouse gases emissions. So mm -hmm. about uh, different ways to capture the, uh, at least part of the greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere. So we have to remember the, the natural uh, the natural sinks of uh, these greenhouse gases. For instance, uh, soil. Soil is pretty important uh, uh, absorbing, for instance, uh, carbon. So some improvements, some manage managements in soil could be helpful. Or also vegetation. So we, if we stop deforestation, if we reduce deforestation and we start doing afforestation and reforestation, that could also help in a natural way to, uh, to capture some of the greenhouse gases emissions. And in general, ecosystem conservation would be something important in terms of these um, CO2 captures. Uh, Currently, uh, literature and even some uh, projects are advocating to geoengineering. Geoengineering is uh, like an artificial way of changing climate. And in particular, some of these technologies uh, that are uh, uh, within the framework of uh, carbon capture uh, and storage, uh, some of them uh, uh, consider, for instance, the, the use of technology that is able to capture carbon from the atmosphere and inject that carbon, for instance, uh, in the very uh, deep uh, soil, for instance, in some um, uh, regions in the soil where you can have rock and where you can have the injection of, of, of these gases. However, what are the impacts of this in the in the air system, in the climate system, in the ecosystems? We really don't know. So this is something that has been debated, but it's like something that is mentioned in, in and is 
actually a lot of funding is given to 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 this type of of technologies and to uh, end my answer i really want to put this uh, very let's say critical thinking about all of these uh, type of measures and it is because maybe you have heard about greenwashing right uh, saying that i'm doing something that is good uh, and I am trying to help, for instance, to uh, reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but I'm actually not doing it at all. And that is something that many companies, starting with fossil fuel companies, are doing. So now economy has all of these uh, carbon markets. Uh, they, there is all of this that is called uh, carbon offsets. So some companies are saying, OK, we are emitting this amount of greenhouse gases, but we are capturing uh, the same amount or a pretty close amount to the ones we are emitting. But at the end, we are not changing actually the process that is uh, affecting the emissions, which is in this case fossil fuels or even the agro industry. It is totally related with fossil fuels and in general uh, greenhouse gases emissions. So I really think that we have to be very careful with that. We have to be very critical because a lot of the current narrative uh, in, in climate change uh, and in general in energy transition and the transition to, to a different future is based on this uh, uh, carbon neutrality or net zero emissions that consider these natural or artificial captures against the, the emissions. Uh, and there, are, there is a pretty, pretty dangerous game that is being played there um, because many, many of the companies are just using the, the concept or the idea to keep doing what they have been doing all the time. And that is the main reason we are in this in this crisis right now. So I really think that we have to be careful with all of these aspects. Thanks so much for using that opportunity of a question to make that point that it's not just about capture, be that natural ways of capturing emissions or man-made um, carbon capture technologies, but it is about um, stopping to disrupt the cycles that we've had such a hand in so far and actually reducing our emissions. Uh, Paula, it's been absolutely a pleasure to learn from you. You've been so insightful and so uh, clear in your ex explanations. I really appreciate you taking the time to teach our audience and to teach me about this really complex topic. Um, I'll also take this opportunity now, just because you touched on it in that last question on net zero, we're going to have some more climate crash courses coming up, one even on net zero and what that term really means. Um, but next week in the second episode, it's on loss and damage. So what that term means and why it's so prevalent in news media right now. And I'll also mention that our organization, the Global Landscapes Forum, is hosting an event alongside COP27, which is what this series is leading up to. And that event is going to be both in person and online on 11th and 12th of November. So my colleague has just dropped in the link to that event in the chats on whatever platforms you're listening. You can go there and learn more about the event. So if you want to dig really deep into the topics that we're here talking about in these climate crash courses, do join us. And uh, thank you so much, Paula, once again for joining today. And thank you for everyone who may, made space in their days to join this DLF Live. And I will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.